Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And uh, this is part two of a series we're doing on cults. And the first one we're discussing is Mormonism. Uh, if you didn't see part one, it's available on my channel. Please check it out. It's about two hours long. I'm going to do a very short little recap of what we covered so far, and then we'll continue on from there. Uh, but first, uh, let me introduce the panelists. Okay, we're going to start with uh, Brother Joe. You want to introduce yourself to everybody and say hi? Uh, <clears throat> this is Joe. I'm, I've got the, the YouTube channel, Jay Byron, and uh, excited to be here today. Okay, brother, thank you for joining us. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, uh, I forgot one thing here before we get going. Sorry for the dead air. Somebody should be saying something and bailing me out of the embarrassing dead air. Okay, <laughs> now what, what was your name? The, the dun, man dun, just dun, the man dun, that just dun, dun. What, what was your name again? Are, are you talking to me, uh, Luke? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. What, was your, what, was your uh, what was your name again? Joseph and uh, or Joe or Jay. And you can call me Jay, or you can call me Joseph, or you can call me Jay Barton. And that's Jay yeah, Barton. Yeah, we, call you, we can call you Jay, but we will not call you, uh, what? What's, how's that joke go? I, I know the old song, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right, well, welcome, Brother Joseph. <laughs> I didn't want to neglect my fun sound effects, okay? Uh, and next we have uh, Brother Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 and I'm happy to be here. Okay, Th thank you, Brother Eric. <laughs> and next we have Brother Jackson. Brother Jackson, you still there? I'm here. Um, my, name is is yourself? I, my name is Jackson. Uh, my YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. Um, I'm, I have Asperger's syndrome, and I love analyzing things, and I consider myself a Bible student rather than a Bible teacher. Okay. I, I also want to say that uh, Brother Jackson has just uh, just begun to um, uh, produce videos, and he. So I hope you go to his channel. It's called Mecha Wing Zero, and he's already got several really good videos. And I hope you go watch those. So welcome, Brother Jackson. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, certainly, we have Brother Mitch. Hello. How are you? My name is Mitch Billenkoff. Uh, my channel is my name, Mitchell Billenkoff. If you can spell it, can't spell it, it's okay. Somehow or another, I think you might find it, uh, especially if you go to Brother Luke's channel. I think he's got me up on there. But I also have Asperger's Syndrome, and um, I just like to talk about the grace of Jesus Christ and nothing more. Okay. Well, how, Brother Mitch, how long have I known you now? Oh, a couple of years I've been on, huh? I, yeah. Yeah. So I've not only known you on YouTube, but then uh, we've had a lot of private conversations on the telephone. And, and uh, uh, all this time, I've been calling you Mitchell Belenkoff. And now I heard you say your name. It, it's Belenkoff. Belenkoff, well, right? Actually, in Russian, it's probably Belenkoff. But I wouldn't say Mitchell Belenkoff because, like, you know, as a matter of fact, my name in, in, in Yugoslavia, where it used to be Yugoslavia, Serbo, Serbia, Croatia area, is as common as Smith or Jones. But here, okay. nobody knows it. So you could say it the way you want. You could call me Ray, or you could call me Jay. <laughs> <laughs> you could call me Jack. Yeah. Okay. We we lost brother uh, Jackson for his. I hope he gets right back with us. Uh, okay, and, and everybody who doesn't know Brother Mitch, uh, please go to his channel. It's called Mitchell Belankov, B-I-L-A-N-K-O-V. And as he said, he, I, I've got him on my channel featured. And, and uh, so uh, watch a lot of his videos because you certainly uh, will learn a lot. And I have one playlist called Brother Mitch Interesting Insights because he just seems to have insights that uh, <laughs> they're different than the rest of us and it's it, it's really wonderful to see see things from his viewpoint uh, okay so now we're going to continue but first let me just say that when I talk about use the word cult uh, I'm I'm saying it in this sense 
but uh, if if a group of people are in a religion and they um, the, a lot of people would think it's some sect or denomination of Christianity if they would fall under like this big umbrella that's called Christianity uh, but they are teaching a false message that's not real Christianity then I would refer to that as a cult that's the way I'm defining and using the word cult in this case so um, Mormons uh, do fit into that category because a lot of people think that Mormons is just another type of Christianity but since we started this study we pointed out that uh, what they believe is certainly not biblical uh, and, and we only uh, began to touch on the problems uh, so please go to part uh, one and you'll see what we've already covered uh, and uh, let's let's go on now that what I'm going to do is the, the main uh, books that Mormons use for their doctrines they use the King James Version of the Bible however uh, the way they see the Bible is that uh, it's in error and uh, it's just like the Bible and the church have gone into apostasy they're wrong and they needed to be corrected uh, so that's why they came up with another book called the Book of Mormon and then another one called Pearl of Great Price and then another uh, collection of their writings called Doctrines and Covenants. So these are the four books that they use for their teaching. However, the Bible is more like just a uh, for show. It's really it's like someone that puts a Bible on their bookshelf but never refers to it in their life. You know, they really think the Bible is is least of them all, and uh, you know, it's it is superseded by all the other the other uh, books of Mormonism. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through each one of their doctrines and quoting where we got this from, which of their books, and then we're going to look at Bible verses to see if uh, they agree or not. Okay, so uh, last time we talked about, we, when we left off last time we were talking about the fact that uh, Mormonism teaches that uh, we, uh, it says, uh, Uh, after the book, after the Bible hath gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church, so they think the Bible and the church has gone into abomination and apostasy. Uh, there, uh, there are many plain things uh, taken away. So in others, there's a lot more to it than the Bible says. So they came up with this Book of Mormon, and then they also said that the Jesus' death on the cross uh, doesn't pay for all sins. There are certain types of sins that uh, the shedding of your own blood was required. Jesus' blood was not sufficient. So that's what we discussed just when we left off, and uh, we covered that. So let's move on now to the next doctrine, and it says, uh, the current teaching of the Mormon Church, the quote, true church is the Mormon Church. The church Christ set up was lost until Joseph Smith restored it. Uh, it says, in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith wrote, My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. I was answered that I should join none of them, for they were all wrong. That's from the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith, uh, 2, colon 16 and 17. Uh, so uh, they believe that all the churches went into apostasy, and that the the Bible itself is apostate, that it's uh, incorrect. So first let's go through this uh, point by point. Uh, the church was never lost. Uh, can we go to, well first let me just ask anybody to just say anything that comes to the top of your head, because I've got a few verses in mind that, that will uh, discuss this, but just overall what thoughts come to your head about this so far? The thing that stands out to me is the fact that they think that the Bible is kind of like like incorrect or can't be trusted at some points because I actually I knew a Mormon I was actually very close friends with and she, and her and her family had thought that the footnotes because the LDS Church gives out these Bibles it's a King James version but they have these footnotes and I remember her telling me she thought the footnotes were actually more inspired than the text itself and sometimes the footnotes would say this isn't really correct and that kind of thing and they'd say don't believe this part some of them would so. Yes. 
Okay, very good. And and uh, another thing that they always say when you ask them if they believe the, in, in the Bible is they, they say, well, as as far as long as it's it, it's properly trans uh, interpreted, and that's their way out for everything. Uh, now, obviously, we all agree with that because we 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 have different ways of looking at different verses. Just in a little group of people right now, within the, within the the five of us, we probably see some verses and interpret them a little bit differently. So, some things are are interpreted uh, different ways by different people, and different denominations see it differently. Uh, but uh, then there are also clear verses. I've given Mormons a verse that. Uh, like these proof texts for salvation that uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, and they 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 say that that is like subject to interpretation, you know. So you th they, that's kind of their way out of everything with the Bible. But my question is, if they think that Christianity has got, went into apostasy and needs to be restored, and that the Bible is incorrect and needs to be corrected. Can you think of anybody else that, that agrees with that? Any other sects or religions? Well, the Latter Day Saint movement is kind of bigger than just the the Mormons as we know it. I mean, they're definitely the biggest group, but there are other little splinter groups within them. Like one was called the RLDS, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. They've now changed their name to Community of Christ. But basically, they all share the belief that there's something to this Book of Mormon. Some even dis they disagree about Joseph Smith, they disagree about Brigham Young, they disagree about all kinds of other things. But they all, what they all share in common is the apostasy belief that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I, what I'm wondering is, can you think of any any group outside of LDS or Mormonism that uh, takes the same approach towards Christianity and the Bible? I think of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they have changed the Bible. But when I look at all of these, these sects, it seems like when you talk to ev almost every religion out there that's like off the wall, they say that divinely they're the they're the they're the ones that have the corner on the market when it comes to the truth. And you must come to our church to be saved. And it's like it's, it's all inclusive. And no nobody else. Ever, we have the truth. Don't go anywhere else. Don't get your information from anywhere else. Otherwise, you might be you might be you might be led astray. You know so. Well, we know that Jesus claimed to have a corner on the market that he, when he said that he's the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but through him. So he declared that he is the exclusive way. Uh, but and, and, and we all agree with that. Jesus is the only way. But then what, what these religions are doing is they're all, all coming up with other things and saying this is the way. We're the only way. But it, it, it contradicts the fact that, of what Jesus taught. Uh, so you cited Jehovah Witnesses, and I would say Jehovah Witnesses is one example of this, in that they basically claim that the uh, Christianity went into apostasy just like Mormonism. They agree on that. And they believe that they need to straighten it out and fix it. And, and they believe the Bible is uh, apostate too, so they had to inter come up with their own translation called the New World Translation. But even more important than that, they believe that... Uh, uh, the true uh, inspiration of scripture comes through what their their writings are from the organization called the uh, Watchtower and Track Society. They have like a a, a a group of their leadership that they think they are that's where you go for the answers. And people in Jehovah Witnesses they don't really look at the Bible as, as much as they do as that monthly newsletter. That's where they go for their truth. So mm -hmm. Jehovah Witnesses is one example. And then uh, I'm thinking of another example too that did the same thing. Said Christianity is uh, it, 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 they've changed and they're no longer right, and uh, they need to be corrected. Uh, what other group can you think of did that? I assume you're talking about the Catholics, Luke. No, I wasn't talking about them. But uh, that, if you think that applies to this, tell me how. Well, I think that they uh, they've taken the truth and uh, uh, added the Vatican, added the, uh, the the papacy and rituals and sacraments, and uh, kind of made a, a new religion. I guess they do embrace the truth as a base of their religion, and that's not true of uh, JWs and then Mormons. Yeah. Well, brother, I'm um, my list of, of groups we're going to be going over in this study on cults. 
will be uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, and Roman Catholics. I do believe that Roman Catholicism uh, is the largest of all the cults, but what, the way I see it is that Roman Catholicism, what they did, and the reason you would brought them up is that uh, rather than sola scriptura, they have uh, the traditions of men and the teachings of the Pope, the dictates of the Popes. So they, they said it's not just the scriptures, in fact, uh, what the Pope says even is can uh, contradict or supersede the scriptures. You've got to go by the Pope and the Church Fathers, the, early, uh, the earlier Popes. So it's called the traditions of men. Uh, so in that case you're right, but I, that's not the group I was thinking of. I'm thinking of one more. Christian uh, scientist. Christian scientist. Science. Christian scientist. Okay, let me just tell you, because rather than trying to guess and read my mind, Islam. Now, Islam does not claim to be Christian, do they? But they no. did the same thing that Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses did. Um, they said that Christianity had gone wrong and it needed to be corrected, and, and that uh, they they said Jesus is not the Son of God, and, and he's and he's just another prophet. And then they wrote the Quran to to correct and replace the Bible. That's the same thing that Jehovah Witnesses have done and Mormons have done. Right. Except in, in, in Mormonism, it's really a, a, a very a weird uh, similarity in that Joseph Smith said that an angel appeared to him and told him that Christianity was wrong, needed to be corrected, and gave them a new book. And in Islam, Muhammad said an angel appeared to him. First of all, the Mormon's angel is called moron I. I mean Moroni or whatever, Moroni. So Joseph had, as Smith said, he had an angel named Moroni tell him that. And Muhammad said he had the angel Gabriel come and tell him the same thing, that Christianity was wrong and needed to be corrected, and gave him another book to replace the Bible called the Quran. So isn't it interesting? And can you think of anything in our, in our Bible that warns us about listening to angels? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, that was the, that was first, the first verse I thought of was where Paul says that uh, uh, Satan can even appear as an angel of light. He can as a messenger of light, and so then if he can, so can his uh, his uh, those who are in league with him. So it, it is not just to, to take a, a message from that from a supposed what Joseph Smith called a light being or or some type of angel that he perceived it to be. Um, and then the, the single the single uh, verse that I think that discredits that whole thing is you know when you go to Galatians chapter one verse six through eight it says I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ but though we were an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed. <laughs> Yes. Now, one thing. Now, everybody really notices the part that says, uh, "If an angel tells you a different gospel, he's to be accursed." Right? But mm -hmm. it actually says, "If we or an angel." Mm -hmm. In other words, right. even if people among us come come to you, exactly, even if people from within the church come with you and say it's a different gospel, or even if an angel tells you, no, it's it's false gospel. Right. Okay? So uh, it's interesting that in Islam and in Mormonism, uh, that's the fulfillment of that warning from Paul. Uh, they say they had an angel appear to them with a different gospel. One is, another um, example of that is in Job, too. Okay. You want to elaborate? Jackson? I don't know. Is he, are you there, Jackson? Hmm. Well, okay, maybe he's looking for it. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, elaborate just a little bit on this. All right, go ahead, brother. Well, first of all, the Jews have also abandoned the Bible. The Jews listen to the Mishnah. They they do read the Bible translated by Rashi, but they believe they believe that the Talmud is of more has more weight or authority. And it's funny how in 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 in, in the Catholic Church we have the, the Baltimore Catechism. It seems like everybody's trying to uh, replace the Bible and put their words in there. 
the, the funny thing, the thing that gets me about that, Luke, is you bring that up and you say all these people have the same, you know, around the same basis, specifically with the with the Latter Day Saints, where they say that the Bible and all the Christianity that came out there was an abomination, according to this quote unquote messenger. So it's an abomination. The Bible you can't really trust or anything. So then I I have to come back and say, okay, so why use the Bible at all if you can't trust it at all? If you're saying that if it's an abomination and it's been corrupted, why wouldn't you just toss it out completely and say, you can't even use that book at all. Here's this book, and that's it. But they don't do that. They say, but we can still use it. We can still use it. You just got to use it in conjunction with this, which makes it a little bit more clear on the stuff that isn't quite right. It just doesn't make any common sense. There's no common sense to that. Mm -hmm. well, if I could uh, interject, uh, I, I, in order to get a better grip on what the uh, Mormons believe, I brought up their... Uh, homepage here for the Mormon Church, and right along the same light you were talking about, they use Christianese, and I think they use the Bible because it gives them a base or a foundation on which to uh, trick people. You know, kind of like uh, uh, Obama. You know, how do we how do we trick them today? You know, and they use our own scriptures against us to to pervert what we believe. I'm looking at their basic ordinances, and it says. We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. That's their first article in their Articles of Faith. Uh, what better way to drop a little poison in the tea? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, brother, you, you did a wise thing. You went right to their own site so you can get it from their own mouth what they are, but they don't put a lot of things on the public site now. What I'm, what I'm showing you, when I just read The Pearl of Great Price, you're not going to find that on their worldwide website. Yeah, you're because, right. uh, they want to they want to keep a lot of this secret. They want to draw you in by making you think this is Christian, and two, it's great for your family. That's why people join Mormonism. That's why they stay in Mormonism. It's all about if this is a wonderful way to have a family. So the second article of faith is it goes right to family. Exactly, and that's how it's sold. It's sold in a very opaque wrapper. It's it, they give you this when you see the commercials for the Latter Day Saints. You see these very oh these are nice people and their families are having taking a good time together. But they do they'll never give you all the information. You know, there's a lot of secrets, and that falls in line with a lot of the other secret societies out there. Right, like even their temple ceremonies and stuff. Interestingly, they've so a few people have actually snuck in there with cameras and uploaded the ceremonies on YouTube. If anyone is interested, it's really interesting. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let, now, now let's go on uh, to this uh, within the same point about Mormons being the true church. The church was lost, fell into apostasy. There was not anything left, anything good. So he had to start it over. Uh, let's look at scripture. Uh, can anybody? Post uh, Matthew sixteen eighteen and read it for us. I have to go get my Bible for that. Where did I put that thing? You said Matthew Matthew sixteen eighteen. Yeah. I some dust on there. <laughs> <laughs> you got dust on your Bible, Mitch? Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. That's terrible. Uh, haven't read it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't had to read it. Read it because you don't you have it memorized? Oh, sure. It's upside down, though. <laughs> yeah, I actually put my Bible in the No wonder I memorized it backwards. <laughs> I'm getting dust. Someone read it if you found it. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay. Now we're talking about right now, the claim that the church totally won apostate and Joseph Smith had to reestablish it correctly. So how does this verse affect that, that their claim? Well, to, to me, this, this claim here... Still talking? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of what I was going to say. Okay, this is what I was going to say. You know, it, it. I've always thought this verse is... Oh. Yeah, Jack's, 
Jackson, you're uh, you're uh, disappeared on us again. Now what's going on? Uh, okay, someone else until he gets back. Make a comment on the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, it's going to try. Oh, here he's back. Okay. Jackson. Hello. Oh well. I, yeah. I, I I would guess that that no no matter what Satan does to try to try to malign the words the word and and, and this goes with my words will never pass away. You're not going to stop. His his words are going to go out. So you know so changing them or whatever's going to happen it you know um, but but basically his word is going is going to go forth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I made a video. Uh, I don't remember the name of it exactly, but talking about Protestants. And uh, I made the point that uh, you have the church in the beginning, uh, and then you have uh, all these different groups that uh, came out of it, and then you had Roman Catholicism come in and kind of take over it, and he actually tried to kill everybody else who would not agree with Roman Catholicism. Uh, but during all of this history, uh, a true remnant of the church itself has survived through all of history. The, the, the church has never been lost completely and had to be started over from, even though you might have a large percentage of it that's gone off and splintered in these different factions and into apostasy, but this is telling us that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and that tells me that the church will uh, survive through all of history. Yeah, there's, there's also a verse that there's also a uh, verse in there that says uh, that uh, God will always have a witness upon the earth, even after the rapture. There'll be the 144,000 witnesses miraculously converted. Let's see if we can find who can find Matthew 28:20 20 first and read it. I'm not a speed uh, flipper in here, so. Oh, usually the young people are much faster than us, Mitch. Yeah, I, I know. What did you say, Matthew 28, Matthew, Matthew 28, 20. I got it. Um, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Okay. Now, So now how does that verse answer the claim that Mormons say the church was totally lost and had to be started over by Joseph Smith? Well, wouldn't well, have to be over if he's always there. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. We're waiting. I keep on disappearing, so please go on. <laughs> Jackson, we're waiting for you. You're muted, bud. Oh, I'm muted. No one. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why yeah, I keep on losing problem. connection. I'm I'm really sorry. I just it's keep okay. losing connection. Um, about Matthew twenty-eight, twenty-eight, or twenty-eight, twenty. 2020. I'm always with you until the uh, all through the end of the end of the world or something. So the point is that Jesus says that He will always be with us through the end of time. Okay, it's not like the church is going to be lost and has to be restored. So I've given two verses that I think uh, address the the Mormons claim that the church was totally lost and Joseph Smith had to start it over afresh. Right, right. The, the key here is totally, I think. Like, it's one thing to say, well, the church has, had, has gone into a lot of error, and we need to, um, we need to address this. That's, I feel like that's kind of like what we do as, as grace believers, but, we're, but, but it's quite another to say there's absolutely no one that seems to contradict these verses. Okay, then let me ask you, uh, what does this say in The Pearl of Great Price by Joseph Smith? Um, my object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. I was answered that I should join none of them, for they were all wrong. Who told him that? Joseph Smith wrote that in the Doctrine and Covenants, and he well, said, "Who told who told that to Joseph?" Moral, Smith? Supposedly, Mer the angel moron. I. The angel moron. I. Well, you know, he talked to me once. <laughs> And he told me that all you guys, you know, that 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 we're all wrong, and the only way is 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 you have to start afresh and forget about Joe Smith. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll write the book, 
and, and I'll have them back next week. That, that's funny because Moroni, Moroni just told me he was joking when he talked to you other guys. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this Moroni guy? Were you, were you playing cards with him last week, Joe? He gets, a, he, he gets around, life? man. He gets around. Oh, man, I'll tell you. Well, uh, you know, uh, the angel Gabriel told uh, told uh, Muhammad that even uh, everybody else was wrong, and, and uh, that's the new way. He beat me at cards last week. It gave Gabriel, he owes me some money. <laughs> I think he was cheating. <laughs> So uh, I said this in the first session on Mormonism about uh, uh, I, I suspect that Joseph Smith, who grew up basically as a, as a young con man, that he started this thing maybe as a prank or a con, and he was probably having a really good laugh to himself. What if I told to you, came to you and said, hey, an angel appeared to me and told me Christianity is all wrong, and... Uh, uh, I, have, I have to start it all over again, and, and the angel's name was Moroni. I would be laughing to myself because I'm saying moron. In other words, I'm, I'm almost really calling you a moron if you'll believe me. It's like an, it's an inside joke. I'm insulting your intelligence. Luke, I, you know, we start looking at all these cults, but I'm looking right at uh, mainline Christianity. I got two words for you. Todd Bentley. I mean, yeah, yeah. he's Mr. Angel Appearance, new doctrines and everything else all the time, and he's he's mainline. Yeah. Uh, I have a playlist called Heretics, Wolves, and Sheep's Clothing, and, and Todd Bentley, of course, is on the list, and there's many others that are doing a lot of crazy things that uh, are a lot of people consider it mainline Christianity. You're right. But let's stay on Mormonism for now. Uh, now let's go ask the question about... Uh, Joseph Smith claimed that he would be the head of the church earlier. We addressed that and that uh, uh, they have to believe in him, in Joseph Smith. So uh, uh, so is Joseph Smith the head of the church or is someone else the head of the church? Hmm. Well, they, they see him as a prophet. Well, you weren't here the first time. Let me back up and find where it says that. But uh, they see Joseph Smith as more than a prophet. Uh, let me see. You guys keep talking about that. Well, they do. They do claim to be the church, the Latter Day Church of Jesus Christ, and they would claim him to be the head of their church. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It, it's all kind of strange to me that these people are not connected to the to Jews at all. They're, they're all like disconnected from the whole line of what was going on from beginning to end. I mean, the Bible talked about it coming to Abraham, and then Abraham through the Jews, and then after the Jews, Christ, and then all of a sudden the Jews were cut off, the temple fell, and now people from like, you know, in the middle of America somewhere, somebody up in the North Pole, all of a sudden it's all disjointed. It's not even connected to the scriptures at all. So anybody can just add to it. It's... It, it, Sounds very. Joe Smith sounds like an alias to me. If I was a con man, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I think that was really his name, though. I I, I would have picked Jones, but I, I think these uh, these guys uh, also uh, have claimed to be the lot uh, the renewed Israel in some way too. Okay, let me uh, let me read this. I covered this the first time, but I think it's worth repeating. Uh, this is from uh, uh, their writing, Doctrine and Covenants, uh, chapter 84, verse 74, I guess. It, it says, uh, Joseph Smith says, Verily, verily, I, Christ, say unto you, Joseph Smith, they who believe not on your words and are not baptized in water in my name for the remission of their sins, that they may receive the Holy Ghost shall be damned. So it says in the doctrine of government, uh, doctrine and covenants, that you've got to believe in Joseph Smith's words. So yeah, that's how far they they take that. Uh, so they've got like Joseph Smith as the head of the church, and we know that. And uh, let's look at Ephesians five twenty three. Whoever finds it first, feel free to read it. Well, that's not going to be me. <laughs> 
Ephesians 5.23, you said? Yes. All right, it says, For the husband is the is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Okay, so it says Christ is the head of the church. Now, we all know that, but apparently Mormons don't know it. Christ is the head of the church, not Joseph Smith. Now, let's look at Colossians 1.18. Colossians 1.18. Oh, I'm there. Amazing. He also... He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. So Christ is the head of the body, the church. I don't know. I was just there. Maybe it was like clairvoyance because I'm usually very slow. Yeah. <laughs> next, next you're going to be counting the letters in the Bible and telling us the, you know, uh, each each letter that's. Three uh, three spaces from the from the margin means something. But you have to read them upside, upside down. down. <laughs> and actually, uh, actually, Mitch just did that about three videos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's go on to uh, this another teaching of Mormonism now. Um, the the fall brought mortality and physical death. Not a sinful nature. LDS believes Adam was given two conflicting commands and was supposed to fall. Uh, this is from uh, Mormon doctrine. According to the foreordained plan, Adam was to fall. Adam was to introduce mortality and all that attends it, so that the opportunity for eternal progression and perfection might be offered to all the spirit children of the Father. Okay, what's your impression of that? Well, where did you read that real quickly from, what you just read? Uh, that is from Bruce McConkie's writing called Mormon Doctrine. Because I want, I want to point something out here. Notice how these, these things that the church is teaching and everything, have you noticed how most of them are not actually from the Book of Mormon that they claim to have you read and pray about and everything? You know, that's one of the things that's really standing out to me right now and has stood out to me when I've studied in the past is the Book of Mormon really is not the basis for all these strange beliefs, even though yeah. it is a, is a false book itself and has a wrong account of Jesus coming to the Americas and everything. Notice all these different eclectic sources that they're putting together to formulate all this doctrine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you read that one more time? Yeah. According to the foreordained plan, Adam was to fall. Adam was to introduce mortality in all that attends it, so that the opportunity for eternal progression and perfection might be offered to all the spirit children of the Father. Okay, so in other words, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that we ate of, the, the way to get to heaven is to bite into that fruit and perfect yourself. Is pretty much. What he's saying? Yeah, pretty much. And they won't yeah. let us drink Coke. No, Mitch. Mitch, <laughs> you and I. Mitch, Mitch, you and I kind of think alike. What the person I knew who was Mormon, I pretty much asked him that exact question, almost that you just phrased, and the answer is essentially yes. So the answer is, we don't need Jesus. We need to make it on our own. Yeah, right. we have our. They That's, call that free agency. They take free yes. will to this extreme degree, like that. Now, Luke, I don't know if you covered this, but I think it helps people watching to um, to to give us some to, to explain what the term you used, eternal progression. I don't know if you covered that in the first video, but the but the eternal progression is summed up in the Mormon belief as quote as man is. God once was, and as God is, man may become. That is what eternal progression is in the Mormon faith. Yeah, uh, that's very true. Uh, we didn't cover that in the first one. I believe I have that in a future uh, doctrine we're going to be going over. But we can talk about it okay. since you brought it up now. Why don't you uh, explain that in your own words? What that means. So read it one more time, and sure. then let's let's discuss what that actually means. Sure. Eternal progression is the concept that, that, quote, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Now, this is just, I mean, it flies in the face of everything we understand as Christians. This is saying God was once just like us. So when God says he was eternal as the Father, 
uh, forget that. He was once like us, like a person, lived like a person did, lived his flesh and blood, and um, and we can become just like him. That we can become gods just like him. Yeah, and what would naturally follow from that is that he, if he was like us, then he was sin, a sinful man that had to learn to and to to get above that and become a god. And yes. that and Eric, you, if you will become a Mormon and follow all their teachings and do your best, then eventually you can progress into a god yourself. Yeah, do you so I'm told. <laughs> Uh, My hopes Eric, aren't hot for that one. <laughs> it's so funny how they just take the truth and they flip it. it well, it's, it's the same with all religion. They, 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 they go right back to working their way to become perfect, doing the exact same thing that Satan wants them to do, which is praying to Satan and, and making yourself into God, building the Tower of Babel. It's, it's the same... You know, the funny thing that all the cults and all the things always believe that they're basically they're all antichrist because they all go fly in the face of the answer of, of the cross and grace to cover you for your sins, that you don't have to be perfect to get there, that, that your perfection and your righteousness is in Christ. It's, it's like so backwards, and then it gives you this, this reason to boast that you're like holier than thou, when you're no, there's no possible way that you're good enough to get to heaven. I no, guess if you no, get there, it'll be a big joke, right? No, you're exactly right. And this comes back to this. This comes back. Um, this comes back constantly to, which is why you mentioned back in, back in uh, Babylonian times. And this is not new. This isn't something that's a new thing. This is all just the same things in a different wrapper. It's just, it's just called something else. It, and again, it, yeah. it comes right back to Satan's first ruse, which is, no, God's lying to you. When you eat of that and you get that knowledge, you're going to be like God. He knows you're going to be like him. Uh -huh. it, it's the same thing. It really is. It really is. The funny thing is that man, man keeps falling for it every time. Because every their single nature time. is to go for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if these cults are vying with each other to get uh, new converts, Islam offers 72 virgins, but my gosh, they're offering godhood. You can't yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they're offering godhood, but, but the, thing, the thing about the, the idea of godhood is think of how much... This appeals to pride more than I think even other cults and everything. Saying you can be a god of your own planet or, or something like that. I mean, I mean it, it's it's, it's like, like it, it, I don't I know don't, it's an extreme example. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the ultimate, isn't it, man? Yeah, and then this is this is by nature. It's all the other New Age philosophies. What do they teach you? You're your own god. You are your god consciousness. It's it's God is not a person. He's a state of consciousness. This is all New Age philosophy, and there's really nothing new about it. It's old. It goes way back to the day of Babylon. Yeah. I, I I've often called New Age religion the oldest religion, and, and get in fact. All religions come from the same original premise when Satan said he wanted to ascend ascend to the throne and then Adam and Eve were told that they could become like God. It's it's this all religions have been since have been based on that one thing that that you can become God. You don't need God because you can become God yourself. And this is right. Mormonism is saying the same thing but in a different way. Well, all of the uh, all of the biggest churches on TV evangelism or TV Christianity are claiming we are our little gods, and that seems to be their one of their uh, big things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They uh, some people even say the word Christian means little Christ. Well, Kenneth Copeland said, uh, "Dogs beget dogs, cats beget cats, and God begets gods." Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's look. So it says that um, man's sin, uh, sinful state entered by, let's look at Genesis 3, 1 through 3. Oh, that's got to be back there with Adam and Eve, huh? Hold yeah. on, I'm getting there. Get it, uh, Here we go. <clears throat> that's in the Old Testament. I got it, I got it. Um, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Hmm. Now that's an interesting thing there, because I always point that out to people. Actually, God didn't say that. He never told them they couldn't touch it. <laughs> And this is where Eve goes wrong trying to reason with Satan. Uh, she begins a process of trying to reason with him. And this is how she gets talked into this. She should have simply rejected what he said outright, walked away, and that would have been the thing to do. But the entertaining of the idea for the point of thinking you can reason with this being uh, is really what opened the door for this all to happen. I've said this on some of my videos in the past. People think that the original sin, the first sin man committed, was disobeying God and eating that fruit. Uh, but I believe the original sin was uh, the sin of uh, unbelief. God said one thing, and Satan said something else, and instead they chose to believe what Satan said instead of what God said. So it's the sin of unbelief, believing Satan rather than God. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so the point uh, we want to make from that verse is this idea. They're, they're putting forth the idea that uh, God set this little trap for them, and he wanted them to, to do it so that they could go through this uh, eternal progression uh, process. Uh, let's look next at Romans 5.12. All right, I'm here. Okay. It says, Wherefore, as one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay. So, uh, we, what do we know what actually happened in, at this time? What was it that actually happened? Their eyes were open. What, what's this, in Romans with sin? Romans 5, 5, 12, as an answer. Oh, yeah, pertaining to Adam and Eve, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, where all men came, sin came through one man, and, mm -hmm. and the forgiveness of sin came through one man. Yes. So if it was about self-perfection, how come, how come it, uh, forgiveness comes through or, or, or righteousness comes through Christ? Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing, too, is the Mormons... I don't even see why or how they think that we need to be forgiven because the fall was actually the right decision by by their uh, theology. It was actually like opening up a world like well, it was like almost almost like Eve was and Adam were given a decision like do you want to open up this world or not and they decided to do so. We look back and we admire them for that pretty much. Yeah. I mean so well, really, this verse doesn't make it makes even less sense when you keep that in mind that they have that theology. Uh, their 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 document says that um, Adam was to introduce mortality. So, is that why it uh, it happened? According to Mormonism, this all happened so that Adam could introduce mortality. <sighs> Actually, actually, why this happened, I can get into it deeply, but just the idea here that their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked shows you that, that uh, okay, so they, they not only found their, their, their mortality, they found out that, they, that they're not perfect. And so now what they're trying to say is, well, now you need to try to make yourself perfect, and I think that that's where it goes awry. Uh, the idea that now that we're naked, we need to clothe ourselves and make us better. And mm -hmm. if you read down, we talk about the coming of the Messiah, the crushing of the serpent, and the whole concept of, of grace through faith, and it just negates the whole thing. It bastardizes the whole text to make it say something different. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to a new uh, Mormon doctrine. It says... Uh, um, his, in, in the book A History of the Church uh, by Joseph Smith Jr. Um, quote 
uh, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. He was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And I will show it from the Bible. So he says that he can show this from the Bible, uh, but uh, what, do we, what does the Bible actually say about that? The Bible, the Bible clearly says that, that, that uh, God is not, not a, a man at all. But just the whole concept, again, is that it makes it like if you're a man, you can become God. So all you have to do is evolute yourself to the point where you become God. It's still, it's still uh, this fruit of Satan no matter any way you dice it. What we want to we determine, determine. Uh, what we're trying to determine is we look at each of their doctrines from their own writings and then see if the Bible agrees. So let's go to Hosea 11.9 and Numbers 23.19. Okay, there's also Revelation. <laughs> okay, we'll go and do that one afterwards, uh, Jackson. Uh, Hosea 11.9, Numbers 23.19. I can't find Hosea. I have tabs in mine. That's cheating, Mitch. Oh, all right, let me take them out then. <laughs> if it would make me look better, I'd appreciate it. Uh, all right. What's it, Hosea? What? Hosea 11.9. There's 11 chapters in Hosea? Okay, hold on. 11.9. I will, I, I will not execute my fierce anger. Um, I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Okay, so he says, for I am God and not a man. Okay, now a Mormon can say, well, he's not a man anymore, but he used to be God. That's what they're trying to claim. I think Hebrew uh, is a good... I mean, how about Numbers 23.19? Anybody have that? Numbers 23... Hey, my tab is missing. Oh, it's over here. I've, I've got 23.19. Go ahead. It says... God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it, or hath he spoken, and shall not, or shall he not make it good? Yeah, uh, it seems to me that uh, this should be rephrased to say, uh, God is no longer a man. <laughs> he yeah. doesn't lie anymore. <laughs> You know, why doesn't it say, uh, I'm no longer a man, I'm God now, so I, I don't lie? Well, I, I personally think Revelation uh, 1.8 is even stronger than these two verses to refute. Yeah, let's, let me, if it's good, I'm going to write it in my notes. Let's go ahead and read it, and if I like it, I'll put it in my book. Okay, this is, this is Revelation 1.8. This is Jesus Christ talking. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Well, it was the Almighty there, is my point. Yeah, okay, so Revelation what? What was it? I want to just write it down. Huh? Revelation 1.8 was what I just 1 read. 1.8, okay. It just flies in the face of all logic, though. I mean, does it make any sense that... If, if God were once a man, then who created God? Or who created the world that, may, that God was in when he was a man? Because certainly when he was a man, he wasn't Almighty God. So how did the universe that he was in get created? If he didn't create it, somebody else must have created it. So it's like, it's impossible. Then there must be another God other than our God. Yeah, it was well, God's great, 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 great grandfather, I guess. But, yeah, yeah. God's great grandfather. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. How, how did Luke? You you read something saying that uh, that uh, Joseph Smith was now in yonder somewhere, like Godhoodish, and they can prove it from the scriptures. How in the world did they do that? How do they contort the scriptures to prove that statement you read? Uh, they uh, well, I didn't read the whole thing. This is just a, the one part of that that I'm quoting. So. Uh, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think they do prove it, but we're proving it's wrong from scriptures, aren't we? Close enough for me. Okay. The uh, Here's the thing about Mormonism. I said in the very first uh, session on Mormons, uh, in the introduction, I said, first of all, the best way to refute Mormonism 
is to prove that the Book of Mormon is just a fabricated book of fiction because they're basing it on the fact that uh, Joseph Smith was a real prophet and gave him a real book uh, to uh, uh, teach him uh, in a, more than the Bible. And they, uh, so if you prove that the Mor Book of Mormon is just fact and fictional and, and, and uh, incorrect, and that's easily done if you go to my YouTube, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and look up uh, Mormonism Debunked. I have a lot of videos in there that show how Mormon, the, the Book of Mormon is easily proven to be incorrect archaeologically, historically, uh, you know, uh, genetically, and so on. Uh, so that, but the problem is that most Mormons get into Mormonism not because of their, they're convinced it's correct. They get into Mormonism because the, the appeal of the family values and they stay in Mormonism because they were either born in it or like the family values and they don't want to leave because they'd be re leaving their family and friends uh, and so this is this is what gets them in it and keeps them in it there have been some Mormons who have left and on my pl my playlist uh, Mormonism debunked I have several of people who are very highly ranked in Mormonism who left and have uh, begun to write and speak out against it these are the people who care about the truth and rather than just caring about, well, I don't really care so much about whether it's right or wrong. I just like it, you know, because they have a good gymnasium. We have a good youth basketball program. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the Mormons shun you when you leave. The Catholics excommunicate you, and the Islamics behead you. I guess uh, <laughs> I guess the is okay there. <laughs> that was real good. That's worth two laughs. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's go on to uh, uh, let's go to look. Well, before we go on, let's go to Malachi three six. In, in Italian, is that Malachi? Malachi papers. The Malachi papers, yeah. Yeah. I got it. <clears throat> For I am the Lord; I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Okay, I am the Lord; I change not. Does that contradict the fact that man changes into a god? Well, I believe I believe so. <laughs> to yes. play that, to, to what to play the what they would say game, they might say, well, now he doesn't change. Now that he has changed into a god, but that's already refuted <clears throat> with all of our other scriptures here. So, mm -hmm. okay, now let's look at um, um, First Chronicles. Uh, 1720. <laughs> o Lord, there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. So their their whole concept that uh, uh, God was once a man and, and he changed and became God pro made progress and became a God and the same as Jesus Christ did and and then that uh, they they too can become gods too uh, this refutes that saying there is none like these there's only one I think another I think another good one that I had uh, picked out in kind of recapping all this today um, was um, Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. And um, I'll give you guys time to get there. Well, if you got it, read it. Um, and that says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for, for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Yeah, I have in my notes here Isaiah 45, 5, 45, 21, 43, 10, and 45, 22. Did you cover all of those? Or? Isaiah actually, in Isaiah 44, um, 45 covers it three more times. Basically, it's saying a very similar uh, text there. Let's so it's saying 40, basically the same things. You got 43, 10 handy? 
4310. Hold on one second. Let me go back to that. 4310 states, um, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. That was the other one I had written out. Yeah. So uh, how could how is it possible then that uh, uh, there are these gods that can men that continue growing into gods and there's there's no we're going to come to a point where it shows that there's there's well billions, it's there's it's billions. not possible <laughs> yeah yeah not if not if you believe the the Bible not that's if you believe why the Bible. that's why they can't use the Bible for their truth because the Bible contradicts doctrine and covenants pearl of great price Book of Mormon and everything else. Everything else that they're taught. Okay, um, now let's look at um, uh, well. I think we covered that. Forbidden to have another God. Let's look at Deuteronomy five seven. Okay. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thou shalt have no other gods. So now Mormons say, well, there's only one god for this planet. Right. That's how they would answer that. Yes. Right. We only have one god for this planet. <laughs> right. But there's other gods for other planets. So the problem with the scripture is it's just not specific enough. It's not telling you the the extra hidden stuff, the little hidden tidbits that we got to let you know later. Yeah. So they would they would dismiss they would dismiss everything we've said, saying that's all true because there's only one God for this planet. But yeah, that actually, what Eric said there is very very key actually to their whole the whole their whole way of looking at things because they like to say that well. Other Christians have to say we don't understand certain things, and we have answers for all of it and everything. I've heard them say that over and over again. That well, you have to say you don't understand, but we have answers to fill in all the gaps and everything. So actually, what Eric just said there is pretty uh, central to their whole theology and mentality. Yeah, that means a rim shot means that's a failure. Not what you said, but their their belief system. <laughs> Okay, let's go to another uh, teaching that they have. It says, um, um, gene genealogical research is required as part of salvation for the dead. Okay? Before vicarious ordinances of salvation exaltation may be performed for those who have died without a knowledge of the gospel, but who presumable uh, would have received it had the opportunity come to them? They must be accurately and properly identified. Uh, hence, genealogical research is required, unquote. That's from Mormon Doctrine by Bruce McConkie, page 308. So, um, did, did you follow the main point that made? Anybody uh, want to say that? Yeah, that well, first? well, it explains why they are so huge on geneal genealogy. They've got their own websites and huge research databases on genealogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, a lot of Jews have been very upset because Mormons are uh, doing a lot of baptisms for dead Jews. And the Jews really object to that because, it, it, of course, it goes against uh, Judaism's teachings and it goes against Christianity because we believe that once a person's dead, uh, then it's settled. You know, we have to either we have to get saved before we die. After we die, then there's no other chances after that. But they're they're teaching that well, you can do baptisms for dead people, your friends, if you, if you care about someone, and they never they never uh, uh, got saved. Then you can do baptism for them and get them saved. Well, there, there's that would make a uh, make sure there's no rush in actually lifting them out of the water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. The Jews actually pray for the dead. They pray for their dead ancestors and do do good mitzvahs for their for their good dead ancestors. But imagine being Jewish and then somebody saying, "Yeah, your uncle Shloimi, he was baptized 
You know, he's dead for 15 years, but now he's been baptized a Christian. I think he's pretty mad at that. No, 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 he's been baptized as a Mormon. Mm -hmm. a Mor yeah, a Mormon. But they that. claim to be Christian, though. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, but if they if if they said they were baptized as a Mormon, the Jewish people might be even more upset than just being yeah. a regular old Christian, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, let's look at First uh, Timothy uh, one four. The crickets start chirping before we have a chance to get there. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think okay, that's I'll give funny. you. A, I'll give you a fair shot. The clicking's not helping either. <laughs> that that makes my ADD go crazy. <laughs> Putting pressure on it, it does actually cause a sense of panic. Yeah, I actually yeah. like that Jeopardy music. If you can get that up. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch, for helping me explain to these people. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. I won't do that anymore. I didn't want to stress you out anymore, really. I thought it was funny. But... First Timothy 1-4. Yeah, they, they all bought me the time I needed to get to Timothy. This is great. Okay, so verse, verse 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Okay, so how does that, what, what is that verse to help explain uh, this question about the uh, Mormon practice? It kind of nails it right on the money, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. It, it, it talks about genealogies. Uh, don't do them. Don't don't give any value to them. Uh, the, the the genealogies in in, the, in our Bible though, uh, is there value in that? Prophetic uh, bloodline of Christ and and uh, proving God's word. Yeah. It's not to baptize any of the past people. Yeah. What were you saying, Jackson? I just said it's not to baptize any of the past people or anything to do with their salvation even. It's just telling us who they are and where they came from. Uh-huh. Yes, that's true. Uh, okay, let's go on to another teaching of Mormonism. It says, uh, Father God is a resurrected man with a physical body. Christ is a separate resurrected man with physical body. The Holy Ghost is a separate man with a spiritual body. There are three totally separate gods. Uh, the, and then this is from uh, Joseph Smith, Jr. I uh, wrote this in History of the Church, uh, uh, 6, 474. The Mormon Church teaches that there exists a plurality of gods. I have always declared God to be a distinct personage. Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost is a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct uh, personages uh, and three gods. If this is in accordance with the New Testament, lo and behold, we have three gods anyhow, and they are plural. Who can contradict it? You know, I, I found that interesting because if you go to their web pages for questions and answer based type things, they will vehemently deny the fact that they are polytheists. They will say Mormons are not polytheists. Mm -hmm. They'll, the, and, the, and the funny part is the way they defend it is by saying that all Christians are actually polytheists. That, that's right. how they defend their position. They say, we're not polytheists because actually all Christians are polytheists because we believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so we're all – so they don't really give a, a, any kind of foundational – you know. <laughs> To answer, to answer the question, too, about who can contradict it, I'm going to say Jesus can contradict it when in John 10.30 he says, I and my Father are one. Are one. Yeah. Or when he says, contradict. Or when he says why, why say you show us the Father? And he tells them, when you've looked upon me, you've looked upon the Father. <laughs> this is, yeah. It's not hard to understand. Um. I, I've done extensive uh, discussions on this in previous playlists about uh, the Godhead and and uh, modalism and Trinitarianism and uh, I know that some of some of us are probably tr Trinitarian or try believe in the triunity of the Godhead and, and some maybe I'm a 
anybody here believes in modalism that there's one God, he just changes forms into three different persons, he operates in three different modes. We've, we've talked about that, but whether it's modalism or Trinitarianism, uh, none of these viewpoints are explain it that there's three different gods. There's one, either one God that changes into four, three different forms, or there's three distinct persons and yet one God, and that, that's the Godhead. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're not polytheists, even though sometimes people want to say that uh, if you're a Trinitarian, you're a polytheist. That's what modalists call call Trinitarians, by the way. Yes. I, again, again, I'd have to say that the logic of the whole thing, it does not make any logical sense whatsoever. For if, if God was a man, first of all, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, so... If you're saying that, that God created the heavens and the earth and he was a man, then who created him? So if there were other worlds that he's supposedly the child of another God, then Jesus would be his child of another God, and he would be able to become perfect and open up his new world. So where is the idea that Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins? It makes no sense because then Jesus is not necessary. All we have to do is grow up. Into become as if we're some sort yeah. of seed growing up into becoming a gods ourselves. So the yes, whole and, concept is it, it, it does it like I said one of these things does it doesn't fit it doesn't work. I, 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 don't, I don't I don't think that they consider Jesus to be God though, Mitch. No, they they, they, they they think he's the spirit brother of Lucifer or something, a child correct, of correct. God, but not God. They, 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 they do appear to be a God. A God. Well, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses, but. It's just the whole thing that okay, who is he then? Is he a, is he becoming like God? Was he once a man? Like the whole well, concept when you read the Bible, you might just as well throw the Bible away because it goes completely against what the Bible says. Right. Well, and in keeping with everything you're saying, Mitch, they believe that we're children of God before we're saved because they actually believe we are the literal spirit children of God. And yes, they spring, you know, yes. Yeah, even though they very rarely talk about this, they actually do think there is a God, the Mother, out there. Yes, and you know, yes, God. they believe God has, has a wife, and God, we are we God, are offspring. God has, exactly, God has sex with this God, the Mother, and then the spirit children, us, are born. So we're as much a child of God as Jesus is, basically. Yes. So it's that's really a, putting us on a that's level. That's so our asterism. That's uh, uh, that's that's again. Again, starting to get into Esther, or not Esther? Um, um, what's your name? Uh, Esther. Yeah, Ishtar. Yeah, uh, again, it's it's what what you were getting at is it's nothing new. It's not right, new. Exactly. It's, this is all Babylonian. It's something old. This right. is this all is back that, to mysticism. This is, same, this is going back to the same <coughs> doctrine that that God is a child of this Ishtar, yep. and that he's he's not really the God. The real God is is uh, what was it Horus, and and so now, yes. So here we have it's the same thing with the 32 point Masons. It's the same thing with the Illuminati. It's just, it's Zoroasterism going way back in the Babylonian times, yes. which has infiltrated uh -huh. Islam, which has in, infiltrated Judaism through the Kabbalah, has, in, has infiltrated Roman Catholicism, has inf, infiltrated Mormonism. So basically, it's Satan from one end to the other. Yeah. It, it, again, it is a return, what we talked about before, and we keep coming back to this subject, but this is what it hinges on. People are enticed by the idea of knowing secret things. That's a big deal nowadays. If you think you know more than somebody else, you have secret knowledge that other people don't have. You have you're enlightened. This is, this, this goes into the Freemasonry. It goes into the whole you know reaching the pinnacle of the pyramid and the all seeing. You know this this is what that all means. It, and he's enticing them. Not the fruit of knowledge. Yeah. What did he entice Eve with? Knowledge, knowledge that she was they not came. meant to have yet. Now, I mentioned this before. I said, you know, people people don't offer the possibility there that, and I believe this to be the case, that it may always have been God's attention, uh, intention to give us that knowledge when he was ready to give us that knowledge, not when we were to take it. So well, he could have always kept the fruit from them. Uh, uh, but, exactly. But, you know, but, the way it happened, I think, you know... It, Right, but but when you look at it, when you go to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it kind of sums that whole thing up when it says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us. 
the natural inclination is as sinful beings to want the secret things even though you don't have access to it, even though you don't know them, you want to know them now. And when somebody presents a way to give you secret and hidden things that you desperately want to know, even if you're not supposed to be involved in these things, people go for it. You see this in Ouija boards, New Age, occultism. You see it in all these things. They're, what are they seeking? They're seeking, they're talking to Fruit. spirit beings. They're seeking secret knowledge that they don't have. And that's why Eve, that's why Eve wanted it. It was good to make her It was lie. appealing. It was appealing to her. Right. Exactly. Okay, can I, um, uh, I want to add another quote to the one we just read, but let me read them both together. Uh, I, I already read this part. Um, the, uh, the Mormon Church teaches that there exists a plurality of gods. Quote, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage. Jesus Christ is a separate and distinct personage from uh, from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. These three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. If this is in accordance with the New Testament, lo and behold, we have three gods anyhow, and they are plural. Now, let me read on now where it says, Joseph Smith, Jr., in History of the Church, uh, 6, colon, 476, colon, 76. It says, quote, Many men say there is one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are only one God. I say that is a strange God anyhow. Three and one and one and three. It is a curious organization. All are to be crammed into one God, according to sectarianism. Uh, it would make the biggest God in all the world. He would be a wonderfully big God. He would be a giant or a monster." Unquote. That's Joseph Smith, Jr. So their philosophy is all the things that are difficult for us to comprehend, we should just disregard? So you take you everything, everything that's difficult to compre comprehend in Scripture, you just disregard it because it's difficult to comprehend? And listen to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it, it's a great hook because uh, it is a doctrine that is very, that's impossible for us to comprehend. We just have to apprehend what's said in the Word. And so using that weakness is a good way to uh, make traditional Christianity look bad and make them look special. Okay, yeah, it's interesting you said that, you said that Eric, uh, because in, in the notes here it, it goes on to say, this is not their quote, it's uh, someone uh, who wrote about them. It says, they teach that the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit should somehow be understood by man. Since the Trinity cannot be understood by man, then it cannot explain the relationship within the Godhead. Of course, this is the point exactly. God's nature is past finding out. His ways are unsearchable, etc. The nature of God is beyond the full comprehension of man, and that is why he is God. Let's look at Romans 11, 33 through 36. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Thirty-six. Anybody else got it yet? There Lord, yes. Yes. Are coming. Uh, oh, I got it. Um, go ahead. I, I have it, but go ahead. Okay. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's your doxology at the end of that. Yeah, that's, that's uh, doxology. So scripture tells us that uh, it's God is beyond our comprehension. I mean, here we're doing our best our, we can to understand him. He's revealed certain things to us, but it, there's so much more to God and more in, uh, beyond our understanding. So we can't re just reject uh, the an idea just because we we are incapable of explaining it or understanding it. You know, you know, it reminds me of a spoiled child. So instead of being thankful for the things that God has been has revealed to you, you choose to be um, <coughs> uh, arrogant to say, "Well, you haven't revealed enough to me." Uh -huh. I mean, it, you know, that's how it's always struck me. And and the, that arrogance stems from a way way higher view of man than Scripture has, which the Mormons seem to have. You know. 
they like to claim be like essentially the message of all their commercials if you look them is be a good person be good you know mm -hmm. do good works be be good you know you're you're good inside and all that stuff and it stems from this at this inflated view of man that causes that arrogance of a, of a spoiled child life that you just mentioned. Yeah, that, that's interesting, Eric. Uh, you know, humility and uh, religion do not mix well. It's oil and water. <laughs> okay, um, let's go to another uh, another uh, doctrine of theirs. This is from Doctrine and Covenants 76 colon 1. Uh, quote, contrary to the views found in the uninspired teachings and creeds of modern Christendom, there are in eternity kingdoms of glory to which all resurrected persons except the sons of perdition will go. We're going to get later to who these sons of perdition are, okay? These are named celestial, terrestrial, and telestial, the glory of each being beyond mortal comprehension. Now here they're saying that we can't comprehend it here. Doctrine and covenants, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so they're they're saying heaven is divided into three kingdoms: the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I go into this more later uh, in the outline here, but they believe that uh, uh, Mormons will go to this highest, this third heaven. If, if they do everything right, follow all the Mormonism teachings and stuff, and that will be their place, the third heaven. And the and third then, heaven has three levels in it, and to go to the highest level of the highest level, they have to be married to another Mormon and sealed in a temple. Okay, very good. I, I, don't, I didn't know any more than that. But, uh, and then, of course, the, the rest of the people end up going to the second or the lower heaven. I remember a young Mormon once tried to tell me, he said, don't, want, don't you want to go to the highest heaven? <laughs> uh, he wasn't telling me I was going to hell. You know, they, Mormons don't tell you you're going to hell because they have hell reserved for this one little group of people. Uh, they call them sons of perdition. I think we'll be coming to that. But uh, they don't believe that we're going to hell. Uh, they uh, they believe that we're just not going to be able to get to the highest levels of heaven unless we are good, become good Mormons. Uh, well, something real quick that uh, – that, um uh, Jackson had touched on, he's absolutely right, is the fact that uh, they are works salvationists. They do not believe that Christ's death was sufficient. They do not believe, they believe that, uh, where I have it written down here, um, they believe that, uh, rem you got to remember, when they, they see us all as gods in different stages, we're, we're, we're born, that we have to go through this flesh life to earn our, our degree, if you will, I guess, to to get to the point where we're good enough to be gods in heaven, and they, you know, Jesus in that regard to them is our elder brother, who who uh, pointed the way, but isn't the way, like Christians believe. He by dying and what he did, he presented the way to get to the way, but he's not really the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it's it's all based on, you like like really. All of the cults, I think, as we've been talking about, are just a different version of work salvation, pretty much, which is why I think we're very, and we've done other shows, you know, very adamant against lordship salvation and that kind of thing, because we want to be as, we want to make sure let me, we're... Let me add to that, that not only are all the cults... Huh? Do we lose Luke? He's frozen. He froze up, bud. <laughs> Unless you're staring like that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> staring contest, go. If that were the case, he'd have really good. He's like, good. I tell you, he's good. <laughs> what happened? Okay, you froze temporarily. You said oh. not. Here's where. Here's where you cut off. You said not only are all the cults work salvationist, and then you froze. Okay, but all of the religions of the world are also work salvationists. Yes. And, uh, they're all based upon personal merit. And whether it's Islam, they've got these uh, five uh, pillars of the faith, and you know you've got to pray five times a day on a rug, and you've got to make a trip to Mecca, and you've got to, whatever it is, they've got all this stuff, and then they got to keep their fingers crossed, hoping that the scale balances, right. and, and they got more good than bad. Uh, Buddhism is also that in that they think that you evolve and you keep on working your way and getting better and better, and evolve into uh, this oneness, this cosmic force. Um, 
Uh, so really all the religions are teach this works thing. The only thing that doesn't preach works is true biblical Christianity and right. we teach that, that uh, no matter how hard we try to work or how good we are able to get, we fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need the Savior, Jesus. And so by the grace of God, he will save us when we trust Jesus. So uh, now let's get to this point I was going to bring up next about... Uh, Remember I said that they think that uh, there's different, different levels of heaven, but who goes to hell? Uh, hell is an institution, as an institution, okay, Mitch's back. Mitch, uh, did we lose you or did you just uh, have to go? Uh, it just, poof, I was gone. Yeah, that kept happening to me at the beginning of this chat, and I had to reconnect my Ethernet cable to a different slot. Now it's working, fortunately. Mitch, Mitch, we were all very worried, thinking that the rapture happened and we got left behind, and Mitch <laughs> got raptured. It would be just like me, but I'd probably go the other way. <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're talking about they Mormons believe that these different levels of heaven and everybody's going to go to heaven, uh, but if you want to get to the highest levels of heaven, you've got to be a Mormon and do all that. Eventually, you'll even become a god of your own planet. But, but who goes to hell in Mormonism? It says, hell is an institution. Hell as an institution is eternal only for the sons of perdition, those who have left Mormonism. That's Mormon they, doctrine. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that I've talked to some Mormons about becoming a son of perdition, and apparently it's not just a membership in the church that you had to have. You have to be endowed. You have to go through all their temple ceremonies and have to become the really, really, really good Mormon and then turn back. Yes. Uh, so I was going to read and continuing to read. It says, inmates come and go as in jail. They do not spend eternity there. A person stays until his debt has been paid to God. And so this is their version of purgatory. So they have this purgatory. People will be going in and out of hell temporarily, and then, and then they can finally work their way up and become good to heaven and then advance and become a god. But there's only one group of people who go to hell and stay there forever and ever. And who are they? That's normal. Any Mormon who leaves. Yeah, these, these are the sons of perdition you were talking about. Yes. Right? Yep. In well, Satanism, it's the same thing. If you, they think that if, you, if you're a Satanist, they say if you leave, then, then you're condemned. So uh, you can never get back to God if you were once a Satanist. So Man, that, that is true. That, that, you know, that really would... I mean, if you're born into that religion and you've grown up in that belief system, can you imagine the trauma uh, of accepting uh, something else other than Mormonism? I mean, that would be really traumatic. Oh, yeah. It's, it's put there for that very reason. They want you to be afraid to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it... As far as the three kingdoms are concerned, too, I just thought I'd throw this out here. Just, I mean, this is so absurd. We probably won't have to talk about this for very long. But in 1 Corinthians 15.40, we read, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. For, this is the verse that Mormons have pointed to to prove that there are three separate kingdoms, and I don't know how they get it from this verse exactly. The only thing I even see in common are the names, like celestial kingdom and terrestrial kingdom. And notice there's no telestial king, telestial anything in this verse. But anyway, that's the verse they pointed to when they act like, because, oh, in the Bible we see the three separate heavens. They pointed me there. So. Yes, very good point. Thank you. Have you guys noticed I laid off the crickets and the clock? Yeah. Thank you. Everybody feeling better now? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let, me read, let me read this from, this is Herbert C. Kimball, uh, who, who was one of the, the president of the church, Kimball. And he, he wrote in Journal and Discourses. By the way, the president of the church is their prophet. Whatever he says is scripture. Okay. It, uh, it says, the uh, the Mormon Church teaches that hell is a temporary place and a person can work their way out. It says, quote, you have often heard me speak about my kindred, 
Will they be saved? Yes, they will, but they will be saved, as I have told you many of these people will. They will first go to hell and remain there until the corruption which, uh, with which they impreg uh, impregnated is burnt out, and the, and the day will yet come uh, when they will come to me and acknowledge me as their Savior, and I will redeem them and bring them forth from hell to where I live and make them my servants, and they will be quite willing to enter into my service. That's nuts. <laughs> Can you imagine the ego on that guy? <laughs> well, I'd like to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, you know, I, I could have, like, I, I'd be like, you know what, get my coffee, like, you know, donuts, whatever I want. Just you have to bring it to me or you have to <laughs> down I, I rem and I remember when I, I remember when I first tenants. I remember when I first told uh, President President, I didn't want a mission to be a Mormon missionary to the Middle East. And, and then he told me, he said, well, you're going to go to hell for a while, and then you'll be quite willing to be my servant. <laughs> well, do they believe then that we will go to hell temporarily, like us on the panel here then? Yeah. Or? Well, what my point was that they, they believe in this purgatory concept. That that uh, unless you're a good Mormon or something, you go right to heaven and you and you're uh, you're going to become a god. Uh, the rest of the people have to go through hell temporarily, and then when they've paid their debt, they can get out, and then they can have one of these other lesser levels of heaven. And you know, mm -hmm. but until until they finally give in and become good Mormons and work their way up, they can't ever go to the top heaven and then become a god. You know, the Catholics have a much more civilized view. Uh, they have indulgences. So when a coin in the tray does ring, a soul from purgatory does spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those indulgences were uh, were uh, were great. Uh, they uh, not only not only were they beneficial to the one that paid them, but the church got very rich. <laughs> no, this is a good idea. <laughs> You're doing right. You know, I'm going to invent a town called hell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Mormons could just send them all to my town. Well, I'll take care of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll make a town called Purgatory, too, while I'm at it. I'll be the charge of, charge of Purgatory. Okay. You know, I get 10% uh, of your uh, profits, though. Yeah. For the idea. Yeah, because that's actually <laughs> another thing. That's another thing. Is the Mormons, you have to tithe 10% to be in good standing with the Mormon Church, or else you are you can't you can't be a member. There. You know, you know, you know. It's funny how all the Christian beliefs are an abomination. Yeah. Except for the parts that they like to retain. Yeah. That I found aren't so abominable, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, I was, if I had a cult, I wouldn't throw that part out either. <laughs> right, right. But, well, it, it, the Bible, it doesn't mean that we have to tithe to be in good standing with a church. I mean, it, it says we, sh we should, but the 10% thing, is there any dogmatic 10% in the Bible? All I remember is some character in the Old Testament. I think it was Isaac or Jacob tithed. No, he's a dick. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness, which is actually where we get Zedoka. Zedek, yeah. Zedoka. Zedoka means charity. And so Abraham gave to righteousness, the king of, 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 of righteousness, 10% of everything he owned. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, he, uh, it's basically said, put something aside. Right. So when, we're instructed, so, Paul instructs us to give from our abundance. As we receive our mm -hmm. abundance, we're instructed to give what we can. And because right. it says God doesn't, God doesn't want a grudging gift. We talked about that before. He wants something from the heart. He wants you to show of a free gift um, that money is not all that it means to you. You know, money is not your God. But it says to give from your abundance. Right. And, and also, that when you say from the heart, that's a very good point. When you're made to give 10%, okay, and let's to, uh, let's just you know I know I, I have faith, but when when it's a it's a command for me to give ten percent and I can't feed my family, that that's 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 a burden. That's a whip. You, you know what? Actually, under the Levitical law, under the law, it's ten percent, and under the Spirit of Grace, 
God owns everything. That's how we manage it. Is that a command in the Old Testament, though, that you have to give to Levitical. It's a Levitical law, not a yeah, yeah. Mosaic law. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an Old Testament okay. law, but the law was removed by Christ. There's no more law anymore. Basically, the, 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 the law is law. So the charity that you give is from the heart. It's from what's been given to you. You give it from the faith that you have. Yes, you can give more than you have, but not grudgingly. According to your faith, give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I think you're all making good points. And the thing, only thing I would add about the ten percent with the in Judaism was that uh, the it was a theocracy. The it was a uh, uh, a religious uh, government, and the uh, you had the high priest, you had all the priests, and you had these people didn't get to own any property. They they didn't get a portion assigned to all like the other tribes did. Their part was to to be uh, priests, and then everybody would pitch in and support that, and that was 10% that went to it. In a way, it was like a, a, a government tax. You, you, that's how what you send to our government, which is a theocracy, and that's what it takes to run this uh, this thing called uh, the, the Jewish priesthood and everything involved in that, and the sacrifice system. Uh, but yeah, as far as what we're supposed to do, 10% uh, doesn't apply to us. Any pastor today that's teaching give 10% uh, is it's not it's not biblical uh, Christian um, biblical Christian Christianity. Uh, it's something that they'd like to do because the pastors need to meet their payroll. They need to meet expenses. But uh, really, uh, what we're told to do is be cheerful givers. We should give as much as we can. And uh, even the woman that gave a penny, Jesus said, "Look, she gave everything she had. That's more than the rich man gave." So you just give what you can, and uh, but don't give anything out of a debt. Like I'm obligated to do it. Because as Mitch said, then what's the? It's not really a. Yeah, it's a grudging gift. Really, yeah. Right. Well, Christ Himself basically what was said that like bring the whole tithe into the barn type of thing. But you know we're talking about the difference between legalism under the law and being released from Christ. So when you look at the scriptures, you have to look at where where what was said when in order to decipher that. And a lot of people will bring you under the whip of the law. Not understand understanding the law of grace uh, balance that was in the scriptures. There was there was a reason why the law was preached. Yeah, we've we've grad we've graduated, Mitch. Uh, we're we've now switched from being obligated under the law to being enticed with greed, with hundredfold returns and such things. Well, yes, of course. Uh, I, I'm I'm definitely into that. The returns are really good. So. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm glad you said that. That's where I was going to go with that because that's that's they tell you, well, well, you do this because God's going to bless you. And then my answer to that is, oh, I see. So I should I should be told and forced to give money with the concept that I'm going to be blessed because of it. What about the concept that I'm going to give money knowing that I'm not going to be given anything in return? About right. like these Christians who want to give. I, one of the things that really gets me is when I hear Christians arguing about their tax status on things that they've given. I'm sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. If you're going to give and then expect, oh, this, well, this is tax deductible, so I get this back, why are you giving? When my premise to give is that's gone. It's disappeared. It's, it's, it's gone. I've given aren't, it away. Aren't There's you just, giving to yourself when you're doing that? Who are you giving to, yourself or, or to God? Right. If it comes right back in a return to you and you never really lose anything, people say, well, yeah, then you can just turn around and use that for another given. It's like, no, no, you're just dancing around the fact that you're trying to get something back from this. The idea is when I give, it's gone. You know the, the concept of let the left hand do not know what the right hand's doing? You, you are giving with the idea of it doesn't mean that much to me. I, I'd, rather I'd rather give it to give somebody it. else, bless them with it, and that's it. It's gone. I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'd go one step further, Eric. I'd say that uh, churches put themselves under the law of the land and corporations in order to not pay taxes. They oh, yeah, oh yes, oh yes. So bondage to the state to save twenty percent or whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I actually cast my bread on the water, and the ducks ate it. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Let me. Uh, can I? Can I go on to another uh, one of their doctrines now? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to quote uh, Article of Faith, James Talmage, and also Mormon doctrine. Uh, it says uh, the Mormon Church is confused about the nature of the Holy Ghost. Quote: He, the Holy Ghost, is an immaterial being possessed of a spiritual form. 
in definite proportions, unquote. That's from Article of Faith. Uh, and then it says, quote, the Holy Ghost can be in only one place at a time, at one time. And he does not and cannot transform himself into any other form or image than that of the man whom he is, though his power and influence can be manifest at one and the same time through all immensity. <laughs> Unquote. Yeah, he hangs out in the bar in Bayonne. He's there a lot. You know, I play pool with him once. He's up in while. he's up in upstate New York where Joseph Smith is from. He hangs out around that area. <laughs> that, that actually makes absolutely no sense to me at all. No, not at all. You know what else about the Holy Ghost and Mormonism is? This is one thing I learned from the person I knew who was Mormon because she would tell her kids when her 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 daughter was misbehaving. She would say her daughter. She would say, you know. When you act like that, you make it impossible for the Holy Ghost to be present. Like the Holy Ghost leaves you when you sin. That was her theology. But I know that's not directly what Luke read or anything like that, but as soon as he mentioned Holy Ghost and Mormonism, I can't neglect but to bring up that you make the Holy Spirit make it impossible for the Holy Ghost to be present. Well, well, and if that's the case, my argument simple is this: How do they argue the point? Well, I know why they're going to argue. They're going to say this is part of the abomination of the Bible and the and the Christianity. But yeah. <clears throat> the Bible specifically says when we become believers, we're all sealed with the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit now, and He dwells in us, how do they explain that He can't be in one place, in several places at once? Well, I could explain everything away. I could, I could, I could sit here and ponder and go. Well, it's not really that he's in one place. It's sort of like a computer. He jumps into one person to the other person so fast that that, that he's he's in all these different places. So I can oh, always uh, come up with an answer if I think about it, and I can oh, write sure. a book, and you can and you can for 1995 a contribution <laughs> to my pocket. I can I can basically explain to you how you can be holy and in. 500 places at one time, and, and, and at the same time, I would become very rich. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, do they did they make this doctrine as an incentive for children not to sin? I mean, I had a neighbor once that told their kid anytime they did something wrong, God killed the kid. <laughs> well, I I I believe that uh, this applies to uh, see this this Holy Spirit they were talking about his name his name is Neo, and uh, he's. Uh, uh, he, I saw a movie about him in The Matrix. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're they're saying that this Holy Spirit has a actual physical form, like like we see ghost movies, and you see that this spirit has a, a human form, and he's limited to that, and he can only be in one place at one time. Okay, so that's what they think of our Holy Spirit. Uh, now let's go to let's look at a couple of verses here. Uh, how about this one here? Uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, or I think it's Corinthians, maybe it's 1 Chronicles, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, 10, and 11. I put down the initial CR, so I'm assuming that's Corinthians, but... Corinthians. First Corinthians. Yeah. Chronicles. 1 Corinthians 2. 2, 10, and 11. Oh, and 11, 4... To us, God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, uh, thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Is, is this the one you wanted yeah, to do? Yeah, that, that is to, to show that the Holy Spirit has omniscience. It knows every thought. Now let's look at look at Luke one thirty five. I'm jumping all over the place here. Yeah, I'm going to jump again too. So I'm making you work. One, would you say one thirty five? Luke one thirty five. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Okay. So the that that should tell us about the omnipotence, the, the the power of the Holy Spirit. My Bible's falling apart. Mm -hmm. uh, it well, had dust on it, but I must have read it once. <laughs> that I guess you've read it a few times. Maybe. Now let's look at Psalms one thirty nine. 
7 through 13. All right, so it's way up in there. Psalms is in the Old Testament, guys. The Old Testament, 139? Uh, yeah, I got that. <laughs> Psalms 139. Is that yeah. after Luke? <laughs> Uh, chapter verses 7 through 13. 7 through 13, you said? Yeah, uh-huh. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Oh, so this is, uh, this is refuting their claim that the Holy Spirit is limited to being in uh, one place at a time. This is saying he, uh, he is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent everywhere. You cannot, go, you cannot go anywhere without the Holy Spirit being there. Some of these doctrines are absolutely impossible to defend if they're using a proper you know, King James Bible. I don't see how they defend it. <laughs> Most Mormons really do not know the Bible very well at all. Well, and they've even got the it footnoted, even, like I said yeah. at the beginning of today. Like, they have a King James. They actually use a KJV, but they have these footnotes, kind of like a Schofield Reference Bible, or like my Ryrie Study Bible that I have over there. But unlike those two things... They think that these opinions expressed in these notes are actually more reliable than the scripture itself because the Mormon church puts them in there. So they're just as inspired, but they're more inspired than the text itself is. And that's how they read the Bible with all these notes at the bottom. Yeah. They say, oh, this says this doesn't really mean that. Because that's basically what the notes say is just this doesn't mean what it says. And this is mis quote unquote mistranslated there and stuff. No, that's what Rashi does. And the, uh, the Jews do that with Rashi. Everything that they say that the Bible says is according to what Rashi says. Okay. Uh, let's, let's look at one more uh, teaching, in, and uh, then that will probably be about the end of today's show. Um, the current teaching of the Mormon Church, uh, uh, Jesus became a God. He was not always God. Uh, a God as a resurrected physical man is literal Father God, Father of Jesus. The Father came and had sexual relations with Mary for uh, Jesus to be conceived on earth. Um, they believe Matthew 1.18 is in error. Uh, Mary in the Virgin? It says, quote, it, quote, Jesus became a God and reached his great state of understanding through consistent effort and continuous obedience to all the gospel truth and universal laws. And that's it written in Gospel Throughout the Ages, page 51. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. Jesus grew up to be God, but he was a man first. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they, right. and, and the thing about the intercourse with Mary is they really try to hide that doctrine. And one person told me, oh, well, that's not an official doctrine. That's just a speculation that some of the leaders have, which is I don't even think it's true. I think some of the official leaders, they call all the stuff we're, t we're touching on in, the, in this video and in the videos to come, they call this deeper doctrine, quote-unquote, deeper doctrine. I don't see what's deep about it. It's just non-Christian doctrine. <laughs> Sounds like Obamacare. You have to you have yeah. to sign the bill and put it into law to know what's in it. Exactly. Right. I, I don't uh, like Obamacare. In, in my in my first uh, uh, session on, on Mormonism, I, I covered a few foundational points that one wanted to make. Uh, uh, oh man, I forgot. What did Jackson just say that made me want to go back to that? Uh, well, I was talking oh, about. Yeah. The, Deeper doctrine. Oh, yeah. or a deeper doctrine, thank you. That's the key word I needed. I, I told about an account where I've had Mormons over to my house, and it reached the point where they wouldn't come over anymore because we pretty much like laid traps for them. I remember this last time uh, I said, uh, uh, I asked them the question. I said, you know, I've, I've heard, I played like I was ignorant, didn't know a lot about it. I said, but I, I, someone told me that, 
Mormons are polytheists that they believe in many gods and, and that they they believe that they can be, eventually become a god of their own planet some days. Is that true? And they say, oh no, 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 that's not true. That's not true. And I say, are you sure that's not true? That's when they first walked in the door before we even got into it. And I, and I said, oh wow, that's uh, that's what I've been told. So and then about an hour later, while they're making their points. Uh, and, and I asked more questions. I got them nailed down, and they finally admitted that they lied to me. And I said, I said, why, why is it you felt necessary to lie to me? I mean, right now, you're admitting that you do believe in polytheism. You believe there's millions of gods, and you believe that Mormons can become a god of their own planet. You just admitted that's this exact same question I asked you in the beginning, and you denied it point blank. Why did you lie to me? And they said, well, because... Uh, you were only ready for milk, not meat. Yeah. <laughs> it is, they're taught. They are actually taught to lie and, and everything else because they justify it by saying they're not ready for all the truth yet. you got to hold that back. Go ahead. It's okay to lie to them in the beginning, and then you can tell them these real truths yeah. later. I think, what year was that by any chance, Luke? Uh, that was probably about, uh, say, about eight, nine years ago. Okay, because the thing is, they've gotten a little bit less like that, I think, as time has gone on because of all the flack they've gotten for it. Like, I have had more mysteries, but still, the principle seems to hold and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very much like Islam. Uh, Allah is called the great deceiver in the Quran for the good of mankind. I always yeah. found that one very interesting myself. Uh, the idea that he's the uh, uh, spirit brother of Lucifer, uh, one thing I will tell you is that a lot of people say that they teach he's the spirit brother of Lucifer. They believe that. but And that, that is true. But they believe that all of us are also the spirit brothers to Lucifer. That every person is born as a spirit from God. And Jesus was born as a spirit from right. God. And, and, yes. and Lucifer was. And in that way, we're all the same. Lucifer... Uh, Jesus, us, we're all spirit brothers. Right. Right. Okay, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, end this now so we can keep the show within the two-hour time frame. And we still have plenty more to go through for the next uh, uh, final. I think we should be able to finish it up next time. But... Uh, so let's just leave a few minutes here now for anybody making like final closing remarks about what we've covered today, and if you're surprised or it's a, um, who wants to go first? Well, I'll go first, Luke. I, I I'm very surprised. Uh, I I knew you know the basics of Mormonism kind of, especially after the last show. But there's been a lot of things uh, on here that have really surprised me, like Jesus being a demigod. You know, he's not just the spirit brother of Lucifer, but he's like the Roman demigod, where the god comes down, uh, has sex with a woman, and the child is half of each. Uh, that is just a very convoluted cult. Uh, it'd be hard to uh, hard to uh, learn. No wonder they're into the family values. It's much simpler to understand. And you're, I'll, I'll make a comment on your last point about the family values, because I said my in my initial introduction in in part one. I put forth this theory. Um, I don't believe people become Mormons uh, because they're convinced of the, the theology and they, they, they've studied it out and believe it's true and it's been proven out to them. They become a Mormon first because most of them are born into Mormon families. Uh, and they don't want to leave because they love their families, they love those relationships. And then other people who join Mormonism because of missionaries coming by or uh, their house, and the reason they join is because they are attracted to this family values, and they, they, they love it, the benefits uh, of, of being in this. And then they don't join because they're convinced. They don't even know the doctrines when they join, and then gradually later they learn all these doctrines. But most people don't care about that. They just want this family value religion. Uh, and they're, because of that, most of them won't leave even if they learn the truth because that's the, they don't care about the truth. They just care about the fact that it's uh, beneficial uh, and uh, then, uh, so that's why you can even prove to a Mormon many times that the theology is all wrong, and it doesn't even matter to them. Okay, Brother Eric? Yeah, I think, I think you have to question any time 
uh, you feel the need or are directed by your um, your elders, whatever they want to call themselves, of your particular religion that you believe in, that when they get you to hide things from people, you know, it never it never occurred to me as a Christian all the time, all the while I've been saved. Um, to hide things from anybody. It's it's always more that I want to share so much I can't cover all of it. I want to tell them everything I know. I want to tell them as much as I know, and I never have as much time on my hands as I want. And I find in these other beliefs there's always something, well, we're, let's hide this, let's hide that, let's not. I really think, folks, if you got that going on in your belief system, you really got to question it at its foundational basis. Why do you feel the need to hide? Your faith should cause you to want to share, not to hide. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. And, uh, uh, you know, I found out that it's true uh, from experience that it is actually part of their training. They're trained to lie. Okay, Brother Jackson. Um, I just want to say that I, I don't... This may it's hard for me to see the appeal, I'll say, of of being of being a Mormon, you know. It's difficult for me to understand because a lot of people like these programs and everything. To me they sound very overwhelming and everything. But if anyone else out there is like me in any way and they they you know, they feel kind of because I can imagine if I was born into a Mormon home or something, feeling kind of trapped or something, I just really uh, would would have would advise you to look into all the theology we're talking about you know you'll see that we used a lot of authentic sources from Mormon leaders and everything we didn't just go off of things and I would just I would just also encourage if you if you're watching this and you're thinking about leaving Mormonism not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and really look at biblical Christianity and what it really teaches mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Brother, Brother Jackson. Well done. Uh, Brother Mitch? Sure. Um, I always think that you should think for yourself. So many people are in the same situation that anybody else is in when they're in a religion or a cult. They don't think they're in a cult, but they never really look or check where they're at. And 99% of the people that come to me, whether it be a Jehovah's Witness, whether it be this sect of Christianity, whether it be Seventh-day Adventist, this, that, the other thing, I actually ask questions and check and look for criticism against it. And, and they would say, that's heresy. Don't ever look at the criticism that's against us. And I'm like, why not? Because that's telling me just to listen to you. <laughs> so, you know, and I would basically say that, that the, the real way that I really found the scriptures was not by my own knowledge, though. I was, I was, I prayed and God opened His eyes and 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 showed me something. But I'm not going to sit here and be a huckster and tell you that well, what I got was the absolute truth. But I would say that that, that according to the scriptures, it is the Holy Spirit that opens up our eyes to see. But there's plenty of false prophets out there that will tell us not to think for ourselves. So read the scriptures and see who Christ is and see that he's much better than what you you were told. He actually sets you free from all the fear of religion and shows you how to love him and shows you that the one love of him is put in your heart. That's what changes you to make you a better person, but that's not what gets you into the kingdom of heaven. His love gets you there, what he did for you, not what you do for him. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brother Mitch. Um, I think that the uh, idea of thinking for yourself is is the important thing to do here. Uh, if a person wants to know the truth, then uh, I do believe that God, if you seek it, you'll find it. Uh, sad, sad though that uh, many Mormons I know. Uh, they don't really want to know the truth because they're very comfortable, and that's they, they what they're getting out of Mormonism. They really like, and even if they're wrong, they don't care. But occasionally, you find a Mormon who does care about the truth, and uh, many of them have been set free from this uh, this.
cultist false religion. We've got more of their doctrines we'll go over next time so you can see some more of their unbiblical uh, belief system. And uh, But before we end the show, you know, I, I always like to do like a kind of a internet altar call or a, a invitation, uh, but I want to ask if anybody else on the panel would like to do that this time, uh, just tell people how to, how to be saved. Uh, if anybody wants to do that instead of me doing it this time. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, basically, you pay me 19.95. No. Actually, the gospel is free. You don't have to pay any pastor or any person anything. The truth is, is that God was so good that he looked down and he, he loved you so much that he did all the work for you to get to heaven. Any person in the whole world who sees the truth, who knows the gospel that I'm telling you, and this is why I'm preaching it to you, is that God loves you. And the name that you're saved by is Jesus. It means God saves. And so that's where, when you want to know salvation and you want to find the truth and you want to find the answer, look to the one who saves, not to these cults that tell you to save yourself. So just ask him. Ask, seek, and knock. And, and as you're praying and as you're seeking and as you're reading the scriptures and checking things out, he'll show you who he is. You just keep ask, seeking, and knocking. He'll show you. He will answer you. And when he does, you'll know it. I know it happened to me. And I pray that, that you just keep asking, seeking, and knocking, and, and you'll come to a knowledge of the saving truth and the good news of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Mitch. Uh, all right. Uh, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the uh, the conversation on the panel. And anybody watching is, uh, you know, G Jesus said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me." Put your faith in Jesus; He'll give you eternal life. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus. <laughs>